going to have a look at the animation controls on the user interface of 3ds Max. The animation controls are located at the bottom right of your screen, right next to the viewport controls, so here they are. And have a look at them. They should look pretty familiar because they look just like your playback controls on your VCR. Only the difference is when you go play, it's play animation. This one plays the very next frame, so it's like step to next frame. And this one goes to the end. This one goes to the start, and this one goes to the previous frame. Underneath your playback controls, you have a frame indicator. Now, this bit here along here at the very top here is called your time bar. Some people like to refer to it as a time scrubber. And as I move the time scrubber along, if you look at your playback frame, you can see that that corresponds with the number that we've got on the time scrubber. So that's what that's for. And what you can do is you can actually highlight that and type in a frame and press enter and it will take the time scrubber to exactly that time. This is your time scale here. So at the moment it's set from 0 to 100 frames. Now in the PAL TV system that would equate to about 4 seconds. For NTSC it is going to be about 3 to bit seconds. In order to animate something, let's quickly just pop something on in, in the in, in Max so that we can have a little bit of play. I'm going to do a box and a sphere because I'm going to show you different ways of animating with different things. Now you notice in my perspective viewport, if I middle mouse scroll out, you can see the two objects in my sphere. So we're going to have a go at animating these two objects. The first method of animating is called auto keying. And that's what this auto button is here. So if I clicked auto, it's like pressing your record button on your VCR. If you press your record button on the VCR, you scroll to a particular time that you want the movement to end at. And then you change something in your viewport. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the select and move. And I'm going to highlight and just move the sphere. Now something interesting has happened in your time bar. Can you see that we've got these two little red boxes? I'll just scroll this off. Can you see one there and one there? Now these are called keyframes. And keyframes are the main animation frames that you create. The, the program itself, 3ds Max, interpolates between these two animation frames. Now back in the day of Disney animation, for example, with 2D animation, you'd have two types of animators. You'd have your keyframe animator, who was the guy with really good drawing skills, who would draw the main frames for the animation. And then you would have your in-between animator, who would draw the frames in between the keyframes. And that was usually the apprentice, the person who was learning to become a keyframe animator. So these red boxes are called keyframes and they represent the main movement positions in your animation. And these frames in between, we refer to as tweens because they are the in-between frames of your animation. The computer does all the in-betweening for us, which is rather nice. Now these keyframes, if I deselect this one, you can see are actually red. And that's because the select and move tool, when you use it in animation, creates red keyframes. So if I was to change the type of animation, so let's do the same thing, but we'll do it with the box. So I'm going to grab the box. There we go. I'm going to go from frame 15. Now if I want to set a keyframe to hold that in place up until frame 15, I just give it a little jiggle. Or I could set a keyframe, but I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Scroll along and say frame 35, the box is going to up as, go up as well. But what if I want to rotate the box as it goes up? There's the rotation key. Now we've got a red keyframe which represents the move and a green keyframe which represents the rotation. If I go to another keyframe and press the scale and I scale the box, we've now got a blue keyframe. So red is move, green is rotate and blue is scale. Now on frame zero, it creates a keyframe on frame 0 for us, so we don't have to set a holding key to hold it from the first position. It remembers where it is and it sets a keyframe. And you can see that that keyframe, if you look really closely, has got a red, a green and a blue because it's setting a holding key for all three transformations on the box. So now if I come back to my playback controls, press play, 
And sure enough, Max has recorded the animation that we've done. So it's pretty simple. Quite like playing back animation. <laughs> it's fun. Notice how it plays back only the active viewport. So if I've got this one selected, it will play back just this viewport. If I've got this one selected, it will play that this viewport. And I've currently got it set on loop. I'll show you how to change that in a second. Now the other type of animation, I'm just going to stop the animation by pressing the play button again and then it just stops it. The other type of animation we have is the set key button, which is the button underneath the auto key button. It's this one here. And similarly, the active to, um, viewport goes red, the time bar goes red, and we're ready to do animation. But this time, when I make a change, say I'm going to go a little bit past the animation we did before, go back to move, and I'm now going to move the box down. Now can you see what happened under our little, this is our little um, time indicator, which is a frame that we're actually on. Can you see that no keyframe has been created? And if I give it a jiggle and flick back, it goes back to its original position, which is a bit confusing because I just moved it. Okay, now what's happening here is the set key button is a way for you to rehearse the positioning of your object before you make a decision. So it's not going to record you as you make the changes on your key. Once you're happy with what you're doing and say, I've changed the rotation and the position. Now, if I press this big key here, can you see this big box with a key on it? <laughs> yes, it's a key. Press that. And now it will set a keyframe for all of these. Can you see that it's a keyframe for both move, rotate and scale? Now I can determine what keys get set by pressing this filters button and I can turn off the ones that I don't want to get set. I like to leave it where it is because I get confused. But if you just want to set the position keys and you don't want it to set rotation, you would deselect rotation and so on. It's got other sorts of keys you can select here too. But for the moment, we're just dealing with the main big three. The big three being the select and move, the select and rotate, and the select and uniform scale. So that is the two different types of animation, set key and auto key. And that's very good. But what if I'm animating away, I'm happy, but I'm running out of time here. I've only got 100 frames to play with. Well, thankfully, you can change how many frames are shown across the bottom here. And it's this little box. It's like a clock with a little box behind it. And when you hover over, it says time configuration. Let's click the box and this little time configuration box comes up. Now the first thing that you notice is that it has a frame rate box and it's this little area here. And in the frame rate box, you've got NTSC, which is the US system of television. You've got the PAL system, which is Australia and Great Britain. And there are other countries that use PAL as well. You can use the film option and you can custom and actually set your number of frames per second. I'm going to go to the PAL system and as I click these, can you see what's happening to the time bar? It's changing numbers here, right? So on TSC, NTSC, it has 100 frames across the bottom and when it's on PAL, it, it changes to 83 because the playback rate changes. And my, some of my keyframes are no longer wholly on a frame because it's actually changing the frame playback rate, the playback rate. Now, as we know, NTSC is 30 frames a, uh, a second. PAL is 25 frames a second. Film is 24 frames a second. And if you want to go for one of the more um, newer formats where they capture at 60 frames, of frames a second or whatever, you can click custom and type it in. Our time display here, here and across the bottom here, at the moment is in frames. I like to leave it on frames, but I'm not the only animator in the world. You can go for simply time code and you can see the time slider bar. It's changed. Numbers 0, 3 and 8. You can go for frames and ticks. Ticks is a 60th of a frame. Or for minutes, seconds and ticks. And it's just changing how your time is being displayed on your time bar and in your frame bar. I'm going to leave it on frames because that's the one I like. Now your playback area enables you to play back at different speeds. So if you've got a particularly tricky bit of animation that you've got to do and you want to play it back at half speed, you can click it here. 
If you want to play back even slower, you can click a quarter speed. You can make it go forward, reverse, or ping pong, which means it goes to one end and then backwards. You can go at double speed or four times time speed. You can loop it or you can make it just the active viewport. I like to leave it an active viewport because it uses a lot of RAM. Click one time speed. Now, when you change these, don't get into the trap of not going back and changing it back to single speed. I've had people who've animated an entire sequence and then when they've gone to render, they realize that the timing's all wrong because I've left their viewport play playback in half speed. So if you go to change this to a different time rate, once you've finished doing the bit that you've done, make sure you go back and change it back to one times. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself into all sorts of trouble. Now, here's the thing. I can change how long this bar represents. So at the moment, I'm in PAL because in Australia, we use the PAL system. End time, I can make that 150 frames. Now, if I press rescale time, the time and the animation tracks that I've got will rescale over all of that period. Don't want to do that once, slow my animation down. But if I just click OK, we can now see that I've got 150 frames to play, back, play, play with, which in the PAL system is about ooh, four, six seconds. There we go. Now, what happens if I change that to, say, a 1,000 frames? You can see that it's very hard to see the division between 10 frames. It's very tricky. So if you're going to go for a long um, animation sequence, say like a thousand frames, you might want to work on certain bits of it at a time. So you might work it, want to work on it from frame 300 to frame 400, for example, and then just work on that bit there. And that's a nice way of animating so you can see all your keys without making it hard to see what you're doing. So you can work on little chunks at a time. You can actually dial in negative time. So if I go minus 100 and click OK, I can actually type, start my time bar at a negative number. It makes no difference to Max. You can render from a negative number as well. It's not a problem. So if you've kind of animated something and realize you actually need to do a bit before the bit that you've animated, you can go back, extend it out in a negative direction. No worries at all. I'm just going to turn that back to zero and 100. Now in this animation area, if I um, click OK to 0 and 100 to open up again, you can see that the length is 100 frames, but the frame count is 101. That's because frame 0 is actually a frame. So if I was to render this out, frame 0 being the first frame, it's the first frame. Very confusing. Frame zero is a frame in itself, it's not a zero frame. So it actually renders out 101 frames rather than 100 frames. In the key steps, just leave this alone. Use the track bar, it's beautiful. Right, I'm going to go OK. Now, I could go through the curve editor with you, but I think that res um, needs to be reserved for its own video. Um, the mini curve editor and the curve editor are quite complex little bits of animation and for beginners we'll just stay away from those just for the moment. Now another thing you can do in 3ds Max is if you're on a keyframe and say I'm just going to move this keyframe wholly on the frame there we go say I want to leave a little note to myself so I know what's happening on that frame I know what that keyframe represents you can do that by clicking add time tag here across the bottom. Click add tag and you can put a little bit of a text to describe. So I might go box up and click OK. Now every time that I have my slider bar on that frame, you can see the word box up showing up on your viewport, which is quite nice. So any other time you don't see anything. When you're on that keyframe, it's saying what that keyframe represents. This is a really good way of not getting confused. Your X, Y, Z positions here represent your absolute positions in X, Y, Z max space. You can type in coordinates if you like as you animate. I tend to just move things around, but other people like to work a little more precisely than I do. And the other thing we've got is when you're in set key, you can actually determine, and in auto key for that matter, determine what the default type of animation curve you have. And most people like to leave that on Bezier curves, which is the very bottom option. 
the very bottom option is useful because it's very good for character animation because it, it allows you to have interpolation between the um, between the keyframes. We'll deal with that in another session. Right, so that's your animation playback controls in 3ds Max. Join us next time on Shatur Academy.